Good afternoon. So today's Wednesday, June 10th, and we're doing our spiritual reading, but Thirsting for Prayer by Father Jacques Philippe, uh, printed by Scepter Press, and 19, uh, 2014. And we're on part two, Conditions for Fruitful Prayer. But first, let's pray to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Conditions for prayer to be fruitful. This is page 33 for those of you following along in the book. John 15, 16, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should last, should abide. In the second chapter, I propose to answer the following question. What will enable our prayer life to bring about a real encounter with God and produce abundant, lasting fruit as a result? In the prologue to his book, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, St. John of the Cross says something quite astonishing. There are many souls who think that they do not have prayer, yet they have much. And on the contrary, others who think that they have much prayer, but have very little. In other words, there are people who think they pray badly, but actually pray well, while others imagine they pray well, but pray badly. So I think we're on dispositions that make fruit prayer fruitful, which is on page 37. The dispositions that make prayer fruitful. Now let us tackle the question of discerning the genuineness of our prayer from a different angle, not the fruits it brings, but the way we set about praying. A first point, which follows from what I am going to say later, but it is good to emphasize it, is that fidelity should be a principal quality of prayer. Jesus does not ask us to pray well. He asks us to pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? But the Holy Spirit praying, there are different modes of and methods that people try to use, such as using the name of Jesus, uh, setting it to breathing, of things like that. But in particular, as pray without ceasing is praying is a dedicated life. Your life is dedicated, that everything is to become prayer. Faithfulness, if, of course, it is not just routine, but is molded by a sincere desire to find God, please him and love him. To find God, to please him and to love him, will produce all the rest. The main battle in the prayer life is perseverance, sticking to this. Because if we just go by emotions when we're enthused, that we can get into all this prayer and try out all this stuff, but then it can become humdrum. And especially if we expect emotional highs all the time from prayer, or even most of the time from prayer. It's, it often doesn't happen that way. So uh, we have to be to persevere, we have to be dedicated in it, no matter what. Dedicated in, in investment of time, and probably special times, as well in the day, uh, to uh, be sort of connecting points for prayer throughout the rest of the day. 
as St. Teresa of Avila notes, the devil does all he can to get souls away from faithfulness to prayer, using every possible or imaginable excuse. It's pointless. You're not worthy to pray. You're wasting your time. You'd pray better if you put it off till tomorrow. There's this urgent thing that you must do now. And it's not praying. It should. It would be a shame to miss that fantastic TV program of this or that or the other thing, the entertainment thing. What are people going to think of you? If you say, oh, I, I, I really I don't, I can't talk right now. I have to talk to God. I have to pray. Reminds me of a priest I knew. And <coughs> he always said he had a special time for prayer. When people would call him at this time, he instructed the secretary that he, he was involved in a very important meeting, which was true. He was meeting with God. He was praying. And it said he'll get back to you as soon as his meeting is over. And he had special times of day for that. And the and he was not to be disturbed. And there's a priest I know he prays in church. And when people come up to talk to me, he said, oh, excuse me, I'm talking to God. So I'll get to you later on. This is more important. <laughs> you hold that, you hold your thought. And... Um, so there can be all sorts of things, temptations to get out of it. And one temptation that uh, C.S. Lewis talks about in the uh, screw tape letters is, oh, it's not real prayer unless you have you really, really feel it and you really feel like doing it. Well, you're going to do it less and less. And then after a while, you're going to notice you're not even going to notice that you're not praying at all. It's like exercise. So you exercise. You, have, you might start off and be all enthused about it and enjoy it, but then after a while, uh, it's not, and, you, and exercising every day and doing this and that, uh, and then you just stop doing it. You do it less and less, and the, uh, the less you do it, the, the less capable you are of doing it. And so uh, it takes this discipline, this this discipline of commitment and perseverance in prayer. St. Teresa explains that it is natural for the devil to put up a stiff fight on this point. For someone faithful to prayer is quite certainly lost to him. That person may still fall, and often, but after each fall, he or she will have the grace to rise up again, even higher than before. As Therese, in her autobiography, Teresa, uh, it has in chapter 19, in order to gain this end, the devil is quite right to use no half measures on this point. Deceiver that he is, he knows that the souls who persevere in prayer are lost to him, and that all the falls he brings about only help them, with God's grace, to spring up again much higher than before and serve our Lord better. Hence his determination on this point. She invites us, therefore, to persevere in prayer. No matter what happens or could happen, whatever the difficulties or naysayers, whether we reach our goal or perish on the way, whether we lack the courage to tackle the trials of the journey or the world, collapse around us. So we have to see prayer not just as a utility, but as a priority. And prayer is this relationship. The relationship with God is the most important relationship. Being centered on the Trinity and in particular, centered on the person of Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man, is most crucial of any relationship, the most crucial of any investment of time or energy. Three, prayer vivified, that is made alive, 
by faith, hope, and love. The idea I'm going to develop now is simple, but very important. And it can provide us with some valuable markers on our personal journey, especially in dealing with the difficulties we meet in our prayer life. It is this. Our prayer will be good and fruitful if it is based on faith, hope, and love. It should be supported by the exercise of the three theological virtues. as they are classically called. It's, it's, it's the terms St. Teresa uses in the way of perfection in chapter 21. The three theological virtues, which are faith, hope, and love. Which are given such importance in scripture, particularly in the teaching of St. Paul, because it is they that drive all Christian life. And they're not isolated from each other. There's really no such thing as saving faith alone. It's never alone. Nor, uh, St. Paul says, hope saves us. It doesn't save us alone. And love is never alone, because it's always undergirded by that inner faith, by that inner hope. And love always expresses itself outwardly in action, in quote-unquote good work. Having decided to dedicate time to personal prayer, we can set about it in all sorts of different ways. Meditate on a passage from scripture, recite a psalm slowly, or sing it, That's a, a, or even listening to other people who are professional singers and good, good at it, uh, singing the psalms, I was just listening to uh, the, the uh, I believe it's Rachmaninoff's uh, Oh Bless the Lord My Soul from uh, Vespers, from, of the All Night Vigil, as it's called, uh, there in Old Slavonic. It was just beautiful, these Ukrainian singers, this magnificent, uh, you know, uh, all four parts, or actually five parts five parts they, uh, and uh, just beautiful and just it, uh, just uplifting just the voice the, the the voices were uplifting in prayer but the psalm that portion of the psalm that they were singing really uh, touched me the words as well as the as the the singing the tune and the voices and and it was a uh, a, a video in, in a church in, in Kiev, I believe. A beautiful church. Well, so meditate on a passage of scripture. That's a, thing, a good thing to do every day. It doesn't have to be a long passage. It doesn't have to be a whole passage. It could even be just the word. But to meditate on that, to think about it. And, and to ponder it and chew over it, and uh, think about it more, and talk to God about it, that could be really good. Psalms, Psalms are the basis of liturgical prayer. Uh, uh, even in the Mass, it's not, well, not the basis of prayer in the Mass, but it's uh, important to the Mass. Our responsorial Psalm, the, the uh, communion verses, the offertory verses, the introits, all this are often from the Psalms. And uh, the Liturgy of the Hours is the, fa the Psalms of the foundation of the, of the Divine Office. So the, uh, the, uh, the uh, liturgical prayer comes basically in two, two parts. There's the sacraments, and in particular the Mass is the highest uh, form of that. And then there's the prayer of the Church the uh, liturgy of the hours, the divine office of uh, morning prayer, evening prayer, and other offices throughout the day. You know, so there's an, an office of readings, or do we have matins, lauds, uh, and the other offices through the time, sext at, at noon time, 
noonish time, mid afternoon, mid morning, all of these things. Not night prayer, Compline. We have this uh, that you can do, and uh, they're based on the Psalms. And, and the Psalms are such great prayers because they run the whole gamut of human emotions, including the emotions we rather admit that we don't have. Uh, so that you find that in the Psalms. And praying scripture, especially because scripture is inspired, it's God breathed. So, and, and there are often so many levels of meaning and of meeting with God and scripture. Converse freely with our Lord, something I always recommend. Just talk to God. I tell people, uh, you talk to yourself. Don't tell me you don't, at least in your head. Direct that to God. It has that as a conversation. But of course, conversation is two-way. Not only are we to speak to God, but we're to listen to God. In fact, that's the more important part of the, of the conversation with God, because he has a lot more to say than we do. He has a lot more content in his message than we have in ours. Let your heart sing. So that's good. Uh, singing. So some people love to sing. Some people love to sing alone and not with other people. Other people love to hear singing. And don't like to sing. There, there are people that don't like music at all. That, that I don't think there's all that many, really. But there are different types of music. There are folk modes of music and, and uh, voices uh, that I'd rather not hear. Uh, but unless there are other voices that there, and uh, even musical instruments, there are some musical instruments that I just don't really like. Uh, but anyway, and uh, should I admit that being Irish, Irish American, bagpipes are one of the instruments I don't particularly care for. But anyway, the uh, although I can find them stirring in certain circumstances. Uh, anyway. So uh, singing freely, let your heart sing. Hymn books, it's always a good thing to have a hymn book. And, uh, and you know the tunes and to sing them, the songs that you like. Uh, someone I knew, uh, he wasn't Catholic, he was an evangelical Protestant. Every day, his mother would gather them around the piano in, uh, right after supper, and they would sing some hymns. And she'd ask, well, to what hymns would you like? What to... And often they sang a lot of the other. She said, oh, here's this one. You probably don't know it, and we'll do that. And, and he built up this repertoire of hymns, and he still loves, he loves hymns. And uh, he associated it with prayer. And uh, a lot of the hymns that he had were just, you know, sort of emotional things, or just, uh, but often had good doctrinal content uh, to it, or at least strong doctrinal content uh, to it, to them. The, say our rosary, or use some other form of repetitive prayer. There are some who are totally opposed to repetitive prayer. They say Jesus forbade it. But it, it's the, uh, Jesus forbade vain repetition, or manipulative repetition. Or uh, he didn't. He he repeated prayers himself. And uh, and in heaven, in the Book of Revelation, and in uh, various. Theophanies, where manifestations of God, the angels are repeating over and over again, holy, 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 or other things, repeating it over and over. So, uh, but people who think repetitive prayer is just worthless, they don't really know how powerful repetitive prayer can be. And sometimes you can't even think. You know, your mind is just God, or it's occupied with something else, you can't get, get it up. This repetitive prayer really, and Touching something helps. Those rosary beads, those Jesus prayer ropes, the, all these other chaplets, they're often very helpful. Sometimes even just holding a cross. I found holding, holding things. It's a, the a, a tactile thing. Use all your senses in prayer. That you can. And even smell. It, you know, with people like incense or scented candles or something like that. Or just uh, smells. Fl smells of flowers or something like that. that uh, others, you know, know, if you're allergic to all that stuff, well, don't try it. Uh, the, but are using all of our senses in prayer. Using uh, 
Praying out loud is good, even when you're alone, because you're never alone. Because you're talking to God, hello. And you're, and then the saints are present. You know, you're, it's all, so praying out loud is good. And reading scripture out loud, I, I also encourage that. Slowly reading scripture out loud. Because then you, things hit you that you admit. I was reading the, uh, uh, the life of, about the life of Samuel in uh, 1 Samuel. And about the, the his conception and all that, and I, I I've been reading that for years. I've, I've been reading the Bible, at least a little bit every day, since I was fourteen. And I've been, went over that story I don't know how many times, but I never noticed that there were other children born to Hannah after Samuel. I never noticed that until the day before yesterday. An evening prayer, an Anglican, Anglican uh, evening prayer. They had uh, that was the reading. So, and I, uh, and I was reading it out loud along with the reader, and it, it hit me. So, and the other forms of repetitive prayer: the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There are, many people have found that tremendously helpful. Or, as I said, just the name of Jesus, Jesus, breathing in and out with that. Jesus Murphy, or if you're Irish, Jesus Murphy, maybe. And um, the oh, all sorts of things, just a very short scripture thing. Lord have mercy is good. Or, or chanting, chanting, or chanting the Kyrie, chanting very, very distant things, chanting very uh, uh, short things short doxologies, sort of other things that can be very helpful. Just be there in front of our Lord without saying anything or even thinking anything, just there. So a priest I knew of, he always made a holy hour at night in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And sometimes he said, Lord, I'm exhausted. I can't read now. I can really can't even think straight now. So I'm just here. Here I am. So he would do that as, as a, a prayer. And an attitude of simple availability or adoration. And what the, practicing the presence of God. If you're doing something and just call to mind the little spark of realization. God is here. God pervade, is pervading this whole thing. And also... I'm doing this for you, Lord. This is part of my sacrifice, my living sacrifice that I am, that St. Paul talks about. And prayer is this sacrifice of praise that scripture talks about, united to the all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ on the cross, of course. So we will return to those different possibilities later on, we are free to use them according to what suits us best at a given point. So there are some people who say, you have to use this devotion of something. You know, our lady of the, you know, a lady of the fire hybrids or whatever it is. And, um, and that may really be really helpful to that person, but it may not be to you. And there are some people who think they have to do every single devotion that comes down the pike. Well, they will be exhausted. And often their prayers will just be rushed and, and rattled through. And, you know, there are times when a prayer rattled through is a lot better than no prayer at all. And, but it's better to try to think about what we're saying while we're doing it. And there are times you just, it's the repetitive prayer where you can't even think of it. If you have not, something else in your mind, you can't get that out of your mind. Or you are, you know, engaged in something else. So that you have to pay attention to that, but then you can use another part of your brain with, with this, uh, repeating this very short prayer. So, or, or, or just thinking, you know, the breathing. Princess Elena of Romania, who is very devoted to praying the, the, the pre Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I think in El Slavonic, or it may have been in Romanian, but anyway, you know, uh, and, uh, she was having surgery and she was put under anesthesia. And as she was coming out of anesthesia, before she really 
became really even conscious of everything. She was, she was conscious of her breathing, and she was breathing in that with that Jesus prayer. She was doing that, so this just connected her. And this drives the devil wild, as as Teresa of Avila pointed out. They, uh, it, it's uh, uh, the, the very name of Jesus is 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 horrific to that. You, you know, in the old vampire movies, the crucifix should hold the crucifix up, and this vampire was horrified of the crucifix. <clears throat> well, the devil is horrified of the name of Jesus. The devil is horrified by prayer. Although, the devil will try to manipulate your prayer, to make it selfish, it, maybe even to make it hateful, to be to have you praying against people. All of this stuff, or that, or, 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 or something that's inflating your ego, or something that to try to use to use this as a, abuse this to have you abuse prayer rather than use prayer. What matters, therefore, is not what particular method we use, but to ascertain the basic dispositions of our heart when we pray. We try to pray with ever purer motives, with ever purer attitudes, with a deeper faith, deeper hope, deeper love. It is these inner dispositions, not a technique or particular form of prayer, that guarantees the fruitfulness of our prayer life. So you recall the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, and the publican, the publican couldn't even look up toward the holy place in the temple. But just looked down and kept saying, uh, repeating, again, repeating, 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 repetitive prayer uh, that Jesus recommends and this, this, Jesus praises this prayer in this situation. This person who is a sinner and knows he's a sinner pray, has uh, the right disposition of prayer, a right disposition of repentance. And his own unworthiness before God, and uh, underneath that love for God, as well as, you know, the conviction of his sinfulness, not God's sinfulness, the Republican sinfulness, but the Pharisee in this situation, again, Pharisees getting swiped at, uh, unfairly, I think, the generalizations against Pharisees in the New Testament were, were uh, slanderous, actually, but uh, not that there weren't Pharisees like that, not that there weren't even disciples of Jesus like that, not that, that there are people of our own faith, of our own whatever, of our own school of theology, whatever, who are like that. Uh, well, the, the legalists, the, the uh, inconsistency, the excusing of oneself. But what this guy does is He's praising himself, and that's his prayer. It's all ego. And uh, an English translation said, and he, as he prayed to himself, because in a sense, he was. He wasn't really praying to God. He wasn't really praising God. He wasn't offering a sacrifice of praise. He was praising himself. So they, his prayer was highly defective. It is these inner disposition, dispositions, not the technique or particular form of prayer, that guarantee the fruitfulness of our prayer life. What matters ultimately is that when we start to pray, when we use this or that method in order to pray, we base everything on inner dispositions of faith, hope, and love. Again, those three theological virtues. Let us look in detail at each of these three theological virtues, their importance and their role in our prayer. Four, the gateway of faith. This is page 40. Prayer is essentially an act of faith. It is even the first and most natural way to express our faith. If someone said, I believe in God, but I don't pray, you, would reasonably, you could reasonably ask that person, what God do you believe in? If the God you believe in is the God of the Bible, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God whom Jesus spent his nights in prayers with, calling him Abba, Father, how could you possibly not feel the slightest desire to talk to him? So, of course, you can believe, you can believe anything and it can have no effect in your life. 
In fact, you can believe something with conviction, but it can be too totally cerebral and have nothing to do with, with how you live or anything. So you can believe in God as some sort of abstraction. You can actually believe everything properly. You can believe everything from the catechism, uh, all the tenets of the creeds, the uh, Nicene, the Athanasian Creed, the, the, the profession of Chalcedon, uh, you name it. But you have, don't really have faith through that. That is, you're not investing yourself in God. And prayer is one of the important investments, investment of time, investment of, of, of everything that you are, investment of emotion, investment of, of intellect, in, investment of speech, investment of all sorts of things in prayer. And it's because of faith, hope, and love. So we have to have faith, not just belief. We have to trust God and his promises and his threats and commit ourselves to Christ. Commit ourselves to all the tenets of the faith. Now, how could you possibly not feel that? Again, this, can, this, cause this could be, you can believe in God and have no feeling about it. Or you can believe in God in a, or have a manipulative feeling. that you're, you're just manipulating God. You're in it to you know, get God to do what you want, or at least to get God so that you don't have to go to hell. And preferably, you don't have to go to hell without repenting of grave sin, which unfortunately is a spiritually suicidal delusion. Faith is expressed, renewed, purified, and strengthened when exercised in prayer. Prayer is a great renewer of faith, a great builder of faith. Even if we do not realize it, like Monsieur Jordan in Molière's comedy Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, the middle class gentleman, who had been speaking prose all his life without realizing it. As soon as we start to pray, we are making an act of faith. So it's like the agnostic's prayer, Oh God, if there is a God, uh, save my soul if I have a soul. That's at least a start. God, make me good if there really is lasting goodness. So pray at least starting on that, that level. As soon as we start to pray, we are making an act of faith. So when we pray, often many uh, liturgical exercises and different rites have the creed, the Nicene Creed, or could be the Athanasian Creed every now and then, or the Apostles' Creed or something like that. It's a, a creedal statement in, in part of, of prayer. So uh, on Sundays, we, uh, we have the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Cosmopolitan Creed in I think all the liturgies, the uh, mass liturgies, divine liturgies of the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches as well, and also Anglican, Lutheran, many others have the Creed, the Nicene Creed as part, or the Apostles' Creed as part of their Sunday uh, Eucharistic worship. And, but that, and praying the Creed is not just saying, oh, I believe this, but I have faith in this. I'm investing myself in this. I'm investing myself that God is the Trinity. It's, it's eternal love. That God, the eternal word, became one of us. I don't just believe this. I'm in, investing myself. I'm, I'm, quote unquote, risking my life for that. And uh, that he died for us. And he, not just for us, he died for me and for every individual me that ever existed, every human being that ever was, and that he rose from the dead, bodily rose from the dead, that he truly ascended into heaven, and that he is going to come again in glory, and that we're going to be bodily resurrected, that there's a communion of saints, this mystical body of Christ, 
and life everlasting, and all that. So, and this, this actually should. Uh, uh, there are times in which I pray that and think that, and it's a very emotional experience. In, in, in uh, affirming that, in praying the profession of the creed. So, so as soon as we start to pray, we're making an act of faith that this is going somewhere, going to someone, or, or at least an act of hope, at least an act of hope in that, that God exists, that it is worthwhile speaking to him. So if God exists, but he's just out there, and, um, you know, he, he, he uh, wound up the clock and then went off to uh, Home Depot or something like that for, and is not particularly concerned about us. Uh, or maybe in some deist forms that he's concerned about the, that we, we prove the test in this life. He's not going to really help us. But it'll prove the test that we can get through, and because uh, in most forms of deism there's no original sin, that uh, and then we'll be rewarded or punished uh, according to this. In some forms of deism there's no hell either, but uh, uh, this uh, in some forms of deism there's punishment and reward. But if God is like that, then you know why bother? Why bother to pray? And some say, well, if God is like that, then you pray because of what it does to you, your disposition, that it helps you in meditation and all that, the, your interior thing, that it, it, it brings you on. And, it, and some would say, even if there's no God, then um, you don't have this faith, this hope and prayer, this will, will help you through a lot. So, but I'd say, well, no, I believe and I have faith in God and I'm investing myself in Jesus Christ. I'm investing myself in this church, the the mystical body of Christ, not just in the head, in uh, the, the ascended Christ, but in his church, his body, all the people who, who are connected to him, living and dead, who are all, I'm, I'm investing myself in all of them. That is worthwhile speaking to him and listening for what he will say. But that's often not a problem. We do the talk, then we just shut the shut the dial, turn the, the the turn the dial to some other station. We don't wait for God to to speak to us, and God usually doesn't speak in words. You know, there are saints and others who get locutions. That is, they you know they hear words in their head, and of course there are people who are uh, schizophrenic and things who hear voices in their head, uh, but. Uh, uh, there are there's that gift that does it visions also people who have given visions private revelations none of which are binding on us only public revelation is binding on us uh, scripture in tradition in the church that's binding on us but uh, the other apparitions even in, in locutions and and re private revelation in, including those that have been not only affirmed but encouraged uh, by the church. We're, uh, we're not bound to ex believe them, accept them, or apply them. Uh, unless, of course, because every real, authentic, private revelation is just like a yellow highlighter on public revelation. So that, so, you know, if, it's, if we're being told to do something in a private revelation that's part of public revelation, that's a, a commandment of, of, of the Lord, uh, then then we are, we are about, but it's because it's public revelation that's fine. So, that he loves us. So that's often a, an act of faith, that God loves us. You know, we can come sort of rationally to say that there's a creator somehow or other, there's this, that, the other, but that this creator really cares about us that this creator really loves us, so that, which is, that's absolutely crucial to Christianity. God is love is one of the shortest lines of scripture. It's not even a whole line, not even a whole verse, but it's the most profound. And it's in that, along with Jesus is Lord, another piece of, of, a, of a verse, uh, 
The first is from First John, and, and the other is from Paul, St. Paul. That through which all scripture is interpreted, all of tradition is applied, all everything is. And our prayer life has to be a pursuit of growing in faith, hope, and love, using prayer to build that up, that to propel us to service of others in the name of God, and even more importantly, serving God in others. That we're not just doing it for them, we're doing it for God. Whatever that is. And not we're not always the most lovable creatures, are we? And certainly not always the most likable. And sometimes it's, I'm doing this for God, I'm trying to see God in this other person, even if it's not that easy at this point that doing this good for this person is, is for God. That it is a good thing to spend some of our time with him. So that's an act of faith. It's not, it's not a waste of time. That he actually is listening. He's not off you know, playing miniature golf somewhere and just can't be bothered with us. Go away, kid, you bother me, uh, W.C. Fields. Thing. God isn't like that. God is infinitely interested in every aspect of us. Always wants us to speak to him and wants us to listen to him. So always interested in our relationship of, of prayer with him, our relationship with everything with him, especially our relationship with love, with him, for him, in him, and by him. Every prayer contains an act of faith that is implicit, but is absolutely fundamental. It is very encouraging to understand that this is an act of faith that unites us to God. Prayer, that is. The more faith a soul has, the more he or she is united to God, says St. John of the Cross in the Scent of Mount Carmel, Book 2, Chapter 9. What brings about union with God is not feelings, or thought processes, but faith. So let's look at why that is so. Five, the role of emotions in our prayer life. The human capacity to feel, to have emotions, is a very valuable faculty. And there is no question of discounting it. Being able to feel, react, be moved, be stirred interiorly, is an essential part of being human. I would even say that in the spiritual life, it is absolutely indispensable that our feelings and emotions play their part. They play a part, but it's not the central part. Not the central part in faith, not the central part in prayer, not even the central part in love. Because if we think that, you know, love is feelings, uh, then... Uh, when we don't feel feelings, we're we thinking that we're not doing love. Or if we feel a feeling towards a person, we think, oh, we, I've fulfilled my love for that person. No, I fulfill my love for that person when I act for the good for that person. And even then, it's not even fulfilling. It's drawing us more deeper and deeper into that service. So, but it is... You know, emotions are, are a central part of being human. Jesus, who is God, God doesn't have emotions, which are chemical reactions. You, know, you have to be physical, you have to be a body to have emotions. Uh, and you have to be more than a body. But, you know, you know uh, animals, at least uh, higher animals, have emotions. Anyone who's had a dog or a cat or other these other things, you know that they have emotions and strong emotions. They seem to have dogs anyway. This is my viewpoint. I'm not a dog specialist, a dog psychologist, or a dog whisperer, or a dog, dog uh, expert. Uh, but dogs that I've known, they seem to have uh, almost the whole gamut of human emotions and often uh, show them. And, uh, So 
so it's part of being, well, then it's emotions are part of being an animal too, as well as part, but crucial to being the human animal, having emotions. So we should cultivate positive emotions. We should cultivate emotions that are going to help us and help other people. And that will draw us on to doing good and to uh, living a virtuous life. And uh, so, of course, Jesus still has his emotions because he's still a body uh, in his resurrected state. But there are no more tears in the state of the resurrected. So he has no negative emotions. So he doesn't have regrets, he doesn't have uh, griefs or sorrows or any of that stuff. He bore all that on the cross, and he certainly had more, of his, more than his share of that in his humanity, in his human life. But, because uh, he knows that, he, he, he knows the experience of that uh, in his resurrected life. So it's not... You know, it's not that Jesus doesn't say, well, I can't relate to you anymore because I don't feel that stuff. That, that's not the case. He actually relates even more with us in his resurrected humanity than he did in his non-resurrected humanity, pre-resurrection humanity. But we have to remember that Jesus is one person, God, the incarnate word, and not two separate persons. Or, or that his person who his humanity well, after the resurrection is, is alien from the humanity before. No, it's the perfection of the humanity that went before. Being able to feel, react, be moved, be stirred interiorly is an essential part of being human. I would even say that in the spiritual life it is absolutely indispensable that our feelings and emotions play their part. There are some people who are more emotional than others. And a, a lot of people are really turned off by really emotive prayer, especially by other people. There are others that, you know, this is just, that's just the, the cat's pajamas. Uh, that's, you know, the, the crucial. So there are a lot of people going into uh, very emotional expressions of prayer, you know, like that, or even very sentimental. Some people like they're you know, really, really sentimental prayers, really, really sentimental devotions, and you know, I, I, I appreciate that, but maybe it's because I'm a guy or something. Like that. But uh, it's it's not this. You know, a lot of these, you know, uh, almost you know, ultra sweet things. But I never use the phrase sweet Jesus. And praying to Jesus. It just seems, you know, maybe Mary calls sweet, you know, Therese, but I just don't call guys sweet. And so anyway, but if that's your thing, great. That's yes, great, great. And uh, then there are people who, uh, you know, the, the emotional thing is very, is very limited. And they, a lot of them want it that way. And uh, other people don't. So, uh, but cultivate things such as the, the aesthetic in prayer. Whatever your aesthetic is, whatever moves you, what types of music move you, what types of poetry move you, what types of art move you. Like I, I love, let's say, Novgorod style iconography, Byzantine iconography. Uh, other people, it's they don't like it at all. Some people like. Highly abstracted art, they just think it has to be, but other people, highly, highly uh, photographic art. It's just, it's just a, a, a realistic, totally realistic. Uh, some people like pastel colors, pastels, some people like bright colors. But it's different with different people. And the same is true with, with uh, music. Some people, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a lot of this. Uh, uh, semi-rock praise music or, or country western music or whatever like that. They really love that. And they, the classical stuff like that, they're not turned on by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach or something. But then there are people that the opposite. That this, you know, that, that. and some people love, you know, uh, twangy, it's, you know, when it's twangy, the music's twangy, or it's, uh, the, the guy's voice is, is, is gravelly or something. People they like 
the different tastes with different people. Uh, but, but cultivate what your aesthetic in prayer of, of the prayer of the... I love high liturgy. I love uh, the smells and bells, even if I cough with the smells sometimes now. Um, the, just in, in the, the dignity, the beautiful dignity of it. And I wish I were more uh, together, I suppose, so that I could be, you know, this splendid liturgist and celebrating mass. So the, 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 maybe that probably that will never be. But anyway, but I that's what I love. I love that type. But other people like, you know, the what a friend of mine called his his wife, who was very active, charismatic. To, uh, Sunday morning aerobics. They, it, it, people just love that. And I appreciate that too. I appreciate the, the movement, the, all of this stuff. I appreciate that very much. And, uh, but, but that's my preference. Uh, you know, the Byzantine liturgies, especially the Slavonic music, I like that much better than the Greco Arabic music. But, uh, although there are, there are tunes in the, in the, uh, the Greco, uh, Greco Arabic, uh, that are, are really beautiful and, and sometimes especially with their beautiful voice on it if doing that or really great like a, a, a father apostolos hill or various other other people singing that it's just beautiful uh but other times it's not so we all have our tastes and we should pray with our taste we shouldn't let our tastes uh restrict us you know we should say we should say well i'm not going to go to that church because the music is awful uh Say, or we say, well, I'm not even going to go to church because the closest what I can get to the music is awful. The the, the preaching is 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 substandard. Uh, this, that, or the other thing. Or some people, I'm not going to go to that church because the people aren't that friendly and all that. Well, you're that's not. It's nice to have a friendly church. It's good, but uh, that's not the the be all and end all. You're there to worship God. And, and sometimes we have to transcend our aesthetic taste. We have to transcend our expectations. But, uh, but of course, if you'd say, well, I, I'll travel this far to get beautiful liturgy rather than, you know, travel a, a closer place to have something like that or something that's meaningful to me, you know, I can see that. Although people should really be uh, loyal and supportive to their territorial parishes. Uh, they really should. But, uh, anyway, this the gateway of faith. This, this uh, the gate. Faith is the gateway into prayer, but also prayer is a gateway into deeper faith. It really can be that for us. And emotions are really helpful in this, cultivating emotions, uh, and the intellectual things to go really uh, strong theological prayers. I often really like that that, that have real content. And the dignity of prayer, the, and, and the aesthetic beauty often of many prayers. That well, I uh, much appreciate the uh, the uh, 2011 translation. Now, that sometimes it's awkward, and I wish they broke it up in sentences. But often in the collects, what do they do? Uh, the things where they could break them up into sentences, they don't. But then they have the end which isn't a sentence at all, and they put a period at, at the, before it, and then there it is, there's no, there's no uh, main verb in it, there's stuff, but, so anyway, but that's uh, uh, maybe being a, a pedantic uh, about uh, proper grammar. But, uh, but uh, they're often much more profound than the, the paraphrases of before, which wanted to be pedestrian, you know, they wanted to, to get to it. But although sometimes I really like the simplicity of the, the translations, the 1969 translations, sometimes I really like the simplicity of them. But, and often I love the, you know, the, the, uh, the Cramner translations, the Anglican translations, sometimes this, often the, 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 the English is just so superb often. And I, I'm, uh, and I'm with some people who pray the Coverdale Psalms, which are, you know, the, it's early, archaic, early modern English. But it often is so, so beautiful the way, way they have it. And sometimes that translation, 
I never thought of it that way. It's, it's good to use different translations with scripture. Because often, because then you'll, it, it, you'll, because it's, it's often a particular Hebrew or Greek word can have many translations, could have many in English, many meanings. And sometimes it's really, uh, really enlightening to see the different meanings that they have. But emotions are important, but they're, they can't be the central thing in prayer. Because if they are, then you, when you're not feeling this or that, then you're not going to pray. So it cannot be that. So, uh, so it's important that our feelings and emotions play their parts, but their parts to play in prayer. It's not that if we have never actually tasted God's presence and tenderness, He remains a stranger for us, far off, an abstraction, purely an idea. Too often in the recent life of the church, believers have suffered from a failure to give its due place to their capacity to feel. One of the Psalms invites us, taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34, 8, which I always see as a Eucharistic, Eucharistic thing. Uh, <clears throat> although a lot of the hosts, let's face it, are not the tasty things, the, the Latin hosts that have come around. But anyway, uh, we have the right to ask for sense perceptible graces so that we can taste something of the mystery of God, the truths of the faith with our bodies, senses, and emotions. So, well, you pray with your body. It's not as if the body is the horse that you that brought you up to the, uh, this, and you just tie the horse outside and then your, your soul goes in or whatever. No, uh, we're to be a unity, body, mind, and spirit. A unity of uh, our physical thing and everything involved in that, and with our brain and all the senses of brain, of feelings, of, of intellect, and even of subconscious and unconscious in, in that in prayer, using that in prayer. The whole come as a whole person in prayer. Well, are you always going to be on, on a, a, a height of of uh, conscious unity in prayer? No. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not always, or even maybe frequently, at a height of conscious unity of, of within myself and above myself. But God is. God is there. Trusting it. We're approaching prayer in faith. So even if I don't feel the prayer, even if I can't get it, I have to just often say to God, you know what I mean. You know what I mean a lot better than I know. So I just put it all, turn it over to you, whatever this whole thing is. So, otherwise we will not be able to understand them and bring them into our lives in a dynamic way. All the methods of prayer and meditation that bring the senses into play and call on our human ability to be moved are perfectly legitimate. I think churches have emptied in the Western world, this is Father uh, Jacques speaking, partly because of the celebrations are too cold and verbose, incapable of awakening any emotion other than boredom. And even the churches, a lot of these modern churches that look like warehouses. And I really went to this one church that will not be named, it won awards. I was looking for it, I didn't, wasn't in this town, I was looking for this church and it was surrounded by this uh, con this concrete wall. And I was asked, I was standing in front of it. They didn't have a sign or anything in front of the thing. Uh, asked, and someone went by and didn't know either. So finally I figured it out. I went, and then there was a doorway and it went in. And inside was glass and all, there was glass along the wall. And a gravel out in this sort of courtyard that went around it. Very bare inside. I think the altar also was sort of concrete and uh, very few images. Even, even the stations of the cross, I think the stations of the cross were just Roman numerals with crosses. And uh, I think there was a, a statue of the Madonna and child and there was a crucifix. And that was it. And the crucifix wasn't both that big. There was a cross that was sort of off center thing uh, uh, that was there. and. I just thought the thing was ugly and distracting and boring 
you know, a, a blank wall. Well, there are people who really find uh, staring at a blank wall a great help to meditation, but I must admit, I don't always find that so. And, uh, but anyway, there's a lot of these, these, they, these uh, modern monstrosities, these w things that look like warehouses. At, at, uh, and uh, you know, and, and office buildings look better than they do, or more aesthetically pleasing. And I uh, feel to that. And the importance of figurative art, of pictures, statues, all that, that we need that stuff. Now, some uh, brethren of ours outside, in, in, in some forms of the Reformation, uh, spiritualists and theologists would say, oh, quite the opposite. They would say, you're all dependent on that, you should be independent. But I find that is sort of an anti-incarnational approach to uh, worship and meditation and art. Art is so important and should be cultivated. And a great tragedy that so much art has been destroyed, you know, in f fanaticisms through, uh, you know, the uh, in, uh, 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 in iconoclastic fur uh, furies uh, that have happened along the time. But even after, in the 20th century, some churches have been recovated. You look at it, some of their beautiful paintings, beautiful design, beautiful decoration, sometimes totally whitewashed or worse. So it's one thing for the, you know, to, sort of this aesthetic starkness to have that, but it's another thing for something to look basically like a, uh, a Burger King. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Burger King is fine for its function. It's, Burger King is supposed to look like a Burger King. A church isn't. A church is supposed to lift you up. It's supposed to be a, a, something a, that's a foretaste of heaven. The same thing with, with the Mass and, and worship in general. It's supposed to be a foretaste of heaven. Uh, but anyway, so boredom. If it's all a, a celebration instead of a celebration, and often it's not even that. There are often people, the, the, the theological content in a lot of this stuff is very, very watered down. So, too cold and verbose, incapable of waking any emotion other than boredom. There is a lot to be done so that in the church's life, and especially in the liturgy, there is beauty and genuinely felt fervor that can touch people's hearts. That said, we also need to recognize the limits of feelings. It is indispensable to taste God, but what we taste of God is not yet God. God is infinitely greater, infinitely beyond everything we can apprehend through our feelings, and also through our intellect. And the pursuit of feelings can become an end in itself. So I think we all know people who hop from uh, religious experience to experience because they always want to feel more and more. And so then when things, you know, tame down and they get used to this, then they're off to something else, some other movement, some other, even some other denomination, some other this, that, the other thing. And that becomes the whole criterion, the feeling part of it. So, you know, you have to be revved up. And the whole thing has to be all, you know, revved up uh, and... Uh, that isn't always the case. That isn't always what you want. I know sometimes very quiet, even mournful worship is very moving to me. So like that, Good Friday, you know, on a Good Friday, I don't want, you know, all this happy, clappy music, as, as nice as that might be. I want sober music. I want stuff that's going to pull at my heartstrings uh, and, and express my grief at the suffering of Christ and the suffering of the people in the world and, and uh, express my uh, sorrow of sin, express all, all this stuff, to, or, or and to cultivate that. I want the music to cultivate that. I want the, the service to cultivate that. But how important music is, uh, for me anyway, in so, for, in so many areas of worship and prayer. But the feelings cannot be the central. The feelings are more the caboose. They may be in some ways a fuel car, 
but they're not the engine. It has to be the virtue of faith itself, the virtue of love itself, the virtue of hope itself. They are the engine. And indeed, it's God's grace in going before that and beneath that. God's grace, the pouring out of God's divine energy. That's all there is. Because it's by grace alone we're saved through faith, but a faith that works through love. A faith that's united to hope. A, a faith that's united to faith, hope, and love. And as St. Paul said, faith, hope, and love in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, but the greatest of these is love. He didn't say the greatest of these is faith, as great as faith is. And the pursuit of feelings can become an end in itself. It may lead to greed, attachment, and lack of freedom. And often nastiness when we don't get our way. In that, you know, if the... Uh, the worship isn't up to my, you know, my emotional uh, whatever. Then uh, it's the it's the pastor's fault. It's the music ministry's fault. It's the other the all these other people's fault. Well, the fault is that I'm a play, attaching everything to feelings rather than to prayer as an objective reality. Our capacity for feelings needs to undergo purification. So, uh, you know, praying for selfish, self, in selfish ways, and and for my own uh, good feeling. So it's it's good to have good feelings in prayer. And sometimes it's good to have bad feelings in prayer, with the area of, of repentance and other things, and, and empathy towards the the sufferings of others. But our Feelings need prayer, uh, purification and prayer. Our thoughts need purification and prayer. We, uh, and our motives need purification and prayer. Prayer is about meeting God, not just about the feelings that God's presence gives us. So we want the giver above all, rather than just the gifts. And especially, uh, we, and, the, and the gifts, we want the gifts as the virtues, as the grace, rather than the wrapping paper of the emotions or, or other things like that. Therefore, we need to accept that sometimes we will feel empty, dry, and arid. And it may go on for years. I know in the monastery, the first year, it was great. The first few months especially was heaven when I first went. Uh, and then and, and, and even at the novice and all that, it was like that. But then... I went into a real period of dryness for uh, for at least, well, for, for f four years. Four years I went into a period of dryness. And there were times there were little sparks, especially aesthetic sparks. Sometimes the music would be so beautiful. The, uh, uh, or uh, a text, the poetry of a particular text, a, a tropar or a... Uh, Oikos or something like that, that, uh, you know, the Katavastia, the, uh, all of these different things, the, uh, uh, the, the different little hymns and stuff there in the Byzantine liturgy uh, often would, would really touch me. But usually not. It was just, I was doing it to do it. But I knew I had to persevere in, in the things of the intellectual prayer, especially. I knew I had to persevere in that, where the emotions were there that I brought the intellectual content, and the faith, that I was praying in faith, <coughs> that the Lord was hearing my prayer, and indeed that the Lord was answering my prayers, even though I didn't feel it, and often when I didn't see it, and often with situations you'd be getting, going from bad to worse in many of these things, I was trusting in God in that, that he was doing all this, that he was there. And others, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, 50 years, 5-0, Years of spirit of prayer aridity, and this is a person who experienced great mystical and uh, uh, trans experiences of transport in in prayer. So then after that, the, the the humdrum thing seemed just like nothing. But she persisted, and she was she was suffering from depression and all that. No one knew it because she applied herself in cheerfulness. She applied herself in faith, and especially she applied herself in love. 
in all of these circumstances. So we can feel empty, dry, and arid. It's sort of a desert, an emotional desert. We have to remember that what matters is not what we feel, but what we believe, what we have faith in, what we're invested in. Not just the what, but the who we're invested in. The whom we are invested in, but uh, in whom we are invested. So, the act of faith goes far beyond our emotions. And really makes us encounter God, even when we are most totally devoid of feeling. Our hearts as dry as the Sahara Desert, without the slightest drop of fervor. And even exhaustion. Sometimes it's, we're just exhausted, emotionally exhausted, for some of this stuff. And, that, and, and uh, that which, you know, spurs us on. That's, it, that, and they, we, we're just going on by pure grace and will. Or will and grace, if you like that TV show. The um, One other thought related to what was said above about prayer as a path of freedom. Remaining faithful to prayer in spite of aridity, exercising faith in prayer sets us progressively free with regards to our feelings. And, and one of the feelings is what will people think of me and all this stuff. Uh, 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 I have to impress people. No. Or even I have to impress God. We cannot impress God. The infinite, the eternal, the all-perfect, the... the uh, the ultimate. You know, he doesn't even want to be oppressed or even tend to impress him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to serve him, to serve others, and to take care of ourselves in the power of his grace. When we are able to bring our feelings and emotions fully into play, and even to awaken faculties that have remained dormant up till now, we make new emotions vibrate in our hearts. Chords of music that have dwelt in oblivion up to this point, as St. Therese of Lisieux calls them. She uses this expression in a beautiful passage in Manuscript C, where she, who had only sisters, is describing intense joy of being given a younger brother, a missionary priest entrusted to her prayers. So, but without being in, coming enslaved to those emotions or dependent on them or addicted to them. Because some people can be addicted to uh, religious experiences, the emotions of a religious experience or emotion of this or that. And uh, they're always looking for a higher high. And that's not the thing. They should be looking for uh, greater virtue. They should be looking for greater union with God. And yes, cultivate the situations that will make the emotions better. You know, the aesthetic, the music, the this, the that, the other thing. And also we need to rest. We need to get our sleep and all this uh, for that. You know, because there, there are people I know of, you know, they, they, you know, they stay up half the night praying and then they don't sleep in the day and they don't get it and they're just worn out. And no wonder there's aridity. No wonder there's it because they've just exhausted themselves. And uh, so we have to we have to take care of our bodies because we are our bodies, as well as taking care of our souls. Of course, the soul is the most important. The, the body will die and will be resurrected, but the soul is immortal. So, but it's it's never really an either or for body and soul. Even in the case of martyrdom. So, because you know, like the, as the Maccabees said, we know that our body will be resurrected. We know that. And we know that God is going to reward us uh, in that. Our modern culture presses people to let themselves be ruled by their feelings alone, rather than uh, a sense of right or wrong, or uh, appropriate or inappropriate, or uh, 
uh, intellectually true uh, something. That's it. You know, if it feels good, how can it be wrong? If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Well, apparently in the song, I can't it was adultery or something. I can't remember. Um, that uh, that wasn't, you know, that's that's wrong. Uh, there it is. So they let themselves rule by their feelings alone. That leads to all kinds of immaturity and even enslavement. With the, and destruction, even self with forms of self-destruction. When, for example, our relationships with others are based only on the pleasure they give us, those relationships are merely childish. True freedom consists of loving others, whether they please us or not. Faithfulness to prayer, no matter what the cost, is valuable training in this sense. So we'll be on 6 uh, next Wednesday. So thank you very much. Let's pray the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's wave back Gwen Davis von Felt. Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. James J. Kahn, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Ryan Bernica, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Terry Coakley, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Timothy Mills, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. John Sheridan, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Larry Lewis, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Melissa McCarthy Trago, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Barbara Blackler Bembury, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Well, God bless you, and uh, let's continue to pray for each other, whether we feel like it or not, and uh, place ourselves in the Lord's hands. Bye now.